I'm Louisa Warren and I act, I direct and I produce films and bits of TV content. I started my career in acting. Growing up I went to a theatre school around school called LTLA and there we did like stage shows and I'd always wanted to kind of move into like TV and film because I like the idea that you could have a product at the end of it. Whereas with theatre it's like you do the show, it's amazing, but then it's gone. And so I, as an actor, when I started, you know, as an adult going to auditions and that sort of thing, I just felt that definitely TV and film was something that I wanted to move into. I like playing weirdos. I don't like playing the normal kind of, you know, girl next door bubbly person. I want to play someone that's, you know, mentally, um, you know, disturbed by something or um, is a killer or my favorite thing is to play someone that's absolutely obsessed. So I've, I've got a movie that I'm preparing at the moment um, that I'll play like the main kind of obsession lady. And, I want to do it so she's like the obsessed roommate or they or that I'm still kind of coming up with it at the moment but like there'll be a person that she's absolutely obsessed with and and just the point of it is seeing what people do when other people aren't there because people are weird people do like strange odd things and I just want to explore that in film in coming up with the concept, what I'll probably do is write out a beat sheet and then, depending on how much budget I have or can get together at the time, I might get someone else to come on board and develop the beat sheet. I, the first kind of idea that I'll do it on like a kind of um, like found footage, self-shot style, I might keep it kind of improvised scenes or I might have something that's semi-scripted. So. Um, it's always best, I think, to have like a second opinion and get advice of others because as much as you think something is finished, someone will always have something to add on to make it better. So when I was at Red Rooms, so we got some amazing opportunities and I remember I just had left and I got a phone call saying, you know, do you want to be in Harry Potter? And we were like, Oh my goodness, amazing. And some of my friends that were there at the time were in the different houses. I was a Hufflepuff. And um, some of my friends were like um, Slytherin and Ravenclaw. It was quite fun actually seeing, it's like, oh, you're in that house, you're in that house. Oh, it says a lot about you. Oh yeah, it was fun. And yeah, we spent a year uh, filming between Leavesden and Pinewood. And it was, it was cool actually because we were each given like a personalised wand that we had. I think mine was number 450. I don't know how I remember in all this. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was really, really cool because you get to go in. My day was like having this like incredible breakfast. Then you have to get, go and get covered in mud because it was all like the fight scenes and stuff. Um, and then we'd go and watch like Jeremy Kyle. <laughs> and then you spend your whole day with, you know, people that you've been mates with at um, theatre school and then, yeah, having a blast. It was very good fun and a very good way to start your career, I think, as an actor, being like, oh, that's that, that's that. Oh, for this scene, we're in front of a massive green thing and you're just looking at a laser. That's how that works. As an actor, when you go to auditions, you know, you don't get it most of the time. And even when you do get it, sometimes you've got to wait forever for your showreel footage and it's really hard to progress forward. And so I thought, well, I know, how about I make my own showreel footage? So I was kind of like gathering people together to do like a web series and, and then I was like, oh, actually, I can turn this into like features and met with some people. And eventually that kind of went on and on and we ended up doing, yeah, this film called Dirty Work, which was like, like an 80s inspired erotic thriller. So with that comes a lot of sex scenes and we interviewed, you know, quite a few people and I just kind of felt like no one really got the vibe of it. Like, cause at the end of the day, the film is about the storyline, not the sex scenes. And I just kind of wanted, especially with there being like lots of nudity for the women, especially, I thought, okay, let's do it 
I, oh, it's my co-producer actually said, look, why don't you direct it? And I was like, oh, I don't know if I can. He was like, yeah, but you're an actor. Of course you can direct actors. And then it was, it was, I was very nervous, but I, in the back of my mind, I thought, actually, that's a really good idea. And I tried to learn all the technical aspects from then. Luckily, I had a fantastic DOP, Edward Louis, um, who shot the movie. And then from then, as I kind of grew and progressed, I just sort of learned about, you know, how to, yeah, how to approach things from a director's point of view. I think directing actors came more naturally than I expected because I kind of know what they're thinking and why they're doing something. And knowing their thought process and how they would have approached a scene, I find perhaps I can tweak it, the scene, um, in a way where perhaps somebody that hasn't had an experience of acting may not think to do. So yeah, it was definitely a benefit being an actor. So I learned a lot about directing from editing. I was very fortunate in that my co-producer Scott, um, he'd directed things before I had, and he said a good way to learn it is to edit because you kind of see the shots that you're missing. and it did end up being a very valuable lesson because as I kind of went on through the movies and I was started editing, I'd be like, oh, if only I had that little moment there from that angle. Or, or the key thing is, how does this scene, the people go in and the people go out? Because sometimes people would like walk through a scene and you've got nothing to cut to and you've got, you need a, a reaction, but actually the people should be there. <laughs> and so, yeah, you kind of learn a lot of the... the the space and where people are supposed to be. The transition from acting to producing, it, it was challenging, but ultimately a lot of fun. I love organisation. I love, you know, getting people together. And typically it is a lot of fun, especially the, the, the lower budget ones, because you get people that want to be there. They're doing it because it is fun and they don't, you know, they're seeing it as like, you know, this is the week I'm going to do that fun thing rather than, oh, I'm going to work again. Um, so you, on those ones, people tend to like muck in a bit more and yeah, it's an enjoyable time. And I think that when we go and do like the higher budget ones, it's just having that knowledge of, all right, I know what I'm doing, but now it's on a bigger scale. And I'm now in a fortunate position where I can go, right, well, in that movie, I can cast myself as this. Or if someone else is directing, I'd say, oh, that's a really good concept. You know, can I be in the movie? I'm producing it with you. Um, I'd suggest a character like this. And it just means that I'm consistently getting showreel material to then promote myself as an actor and then give that footage to my agent to then put me forward for other jobs. So I guess my original plan of, you know, doing, making my own show footage, it has happened, but just on a bigger scale. I first met Stephen M. Smith when, well, people know about each other in the, in the industry anyway, because you, you see what other people are doing, what films they have out, so we knew of each other for ages. And then we'd had some chats about certain movies, and then one day I was doing a siren movie, which is about these, um, sirens that live in the sea and they come to the shore and they start singing and the idea is that the men are attracted to the beach and that sort of thing and I was looking for executive producers and I asked Steve if he wanted to be on board and he said yes and then that was kind of like the first time we had like a formal working relationship but being an exec we weren't producing together at that time it's still one of my favorite movies it's called Mermaid's Curse and I think it's one of my favourites because at the heart of it, it's all about the story. It's um, a film which my co-producer had made many years before on a much, much lower budget. And it's got this real heart to it. Um, and it's not been kind of like, sometimes you make a film, like a distributor's gone, can you make it like X, Y, and Z? Whereas this is, this is a story nothing's had any kind of you know tampering with it so I still I still really like it um for the storyline and what happens but I won't ruin it <laughs> um so then fast forward to um Dollhouse M myself and Steve made this film 
Then fast forward and myself and Steve made a couple of other movies. We did Dollhouse. We did an experimental film, which was lots of fun called um, The Haunting of Hyde House. And we did like a, a ghost hunting kind of presenter style um, film, which is about these presenters that go in and they try looking for ghosts, but then they actually find some. <laughs> and that's Ouija hosts. And eventually we ended up making The Ghosts of Audio Rectory. The Ghosts of Audio Rectory is a fantastic film. It's got quite a few named actors in it. Um, Julian Sands, Christopher Ellison, Colin Baker, who was obviously Doctor Who, um, Toya Wilcox, um, and yeah, a, like a host of people that we'd worked with before. Um, it's based around the real life story of the Ghost of Audio Rectory and the investigations of Harry Price um, while he was there. Now, it's interesting because at that time in the newspapers, it's debated whether there were actually ghosts there because Harry Price was being paid to do these investigations. Is he finding the ghosts or is he finding the ghosts? That's, you know, um, but the story, the, the storyline of Borley Rectory is um, just about him and his investigations there. And we've tried to keep it to real life as possible, even so far as there's this one angle down a corridor where we've just put a big green screen and Steve um, being the amazing producer that he is has managed to get these images from um, the British Library um, which are of the actual boarding house and he's got them like CGI'd into the film it's really really cool and it's like all these little attentions to detail that you may not have noticed like the first time round but it's just having all those elements in there and we had the the pictures of the the rooms in the house and we was trying to buy the stuff to match it exactly um just to just to have something for the bawdy fans really the super effort man i would say is the biggest project champ dog films has done to date champ dog films is the production company that i own and sometimes i work independently or I will attach it to other companies like Empire Studios, Greenway Films, um, who's then attached to Coco Pictures and Guide Watch Films. Um, because as the budgets get bigger, typically you just kind of like staircase upwards. Um, but with The Suit Worth of Man, it's, it was something that, a real learning experience that we ran through Champ Dog. It's an LGBT movie. Um, it's a social thriller. It's, um, it's about this guy, Mache, who uh, has been oppressed sexually from a young age. And there's so many routes the storyline can go down, but he's, he's working in this corporate environment and he's seeing all these like suited people. He wants to have the better job in, he wants a better office. He, and you know, his boss is making him, um, head up this development project of this housing estate because he lives there with his mother and he always has done. And this whole um, incredible journey was thought up by Mitch, Mitchell Marion, who directed the film and wrote the film and produced the film uh, with me. And he takes you on a journey um, of him being followed by these suited people and having these like visions of, um, you know, kissing the other men and then it kind of, you know, ends up in this um, this point in the film where I won't I won't spoil it of what happens, but it, it's literally um, it's horrific. Basically, it's horrific, and it's a um, an example of you know an embodiment of something that happens you know perhaps in your mind or how you feel every day. If you catch my drift. I don't know if that's too vague or <laughs> too mysterious. Um, but yeah, it's like sexual oppression is a thing in society, like even in places that you wouldn't thought it would be. I thought it was, when, I fir when he first sent me the script, I thought, wow, this is something a bit different. This is something I wanted to get involved in. And uh, Mitch's talent really shone to life. And we managed to get um, Ali Farahani attached as the director of photography. Um, obviously he, um, shot The Silent Child, which went to go and, which went and got an Oscar. 
And so we're very, very fortunate. And the film is, I think I'm most proud of because a lot of people from the community came together to make that. And Mitch's work is stunning, you know, as is everybody's on the team. And I think a lot of people gave us a chance. And I think it's a really example of people giving people an opportunity and then producing something amazing as an end result. Raising money for a film is like looking into hell and going, oh, which part shall I jump into next? <laughs> um, a lot of the time, you've just got to be very, very lucky. When I first started out, what I did was I selected um, a few people and I said, I'm doing this. Do you have money? Would you like to come on board? Um, and it's literally that on a bigger scale now, because obviously um, executive producers, that is their job. And so it's a case of, you know, getting your stuff together and going, hi, executive producer, would you like to do this? Yes or no? And fortunately, as time goes on and I've managed to do more and more movies, I've kind of got evidence that stuff's happened because I remember at the beginning it's challenging because people will go but how do I know you can do this and I just remember saving all my tips at the restaurant I used to work in and being like oh you know um, I've managed to save another thousand um, let's just spend it all on something which might not you know happen <laughs> um, I also did a couple of shorts before I managed to kind of move into features um, and I remember that was a real learning curve of, okay, right, I spent that much money on food, whereas I could have just said to everyone, can you bring a packed lunch for the day? And it's, I'm glad I kind of learnt this on like a lower scale. Um, I found that funding applications take a very, very long time. It's very difficult. You could put so much effort into something and not hear back. Um, and I think for certain projects, it is essential to do it. For example, um, I remember the suit with the man, which we um, we tried to, to do it, and um, I found out that we'd, we'd filled up like this whole thing, and then they were like, "Oh, um, we on the website, you know, the scheme actually had finished," and it's like, "What? It didn't say," and they'd done this whole thing, but then for that we ended up doing like a public fundraiser. We managed to had amazing private investors. We got sponsored by um, Impulse, who donated a lot of money, which we're very, very, very grateful for, and really elevated the film. And then we had uh, random people that went on the um, Kickstarter, and they were donating thousands, just anonymously, just to be a part of it, because they thought that the, um, the subject matter was something that touched them, and they wanted to be involved. And so, and then obviously that film wouldn't be what it is without the money. We managed to get it out there, it ends up being BAFTA qualified. And I just think to get recognition, you need to have the money to put it into those festivals to get, to get it in the first place. So it is difficult. And every filmmaker, especially if you don't have the bank of mum and dad, which a lot of us do not have, you just need something to get you going. But what I would say is when there's a will, there's a way. Like I'm working hours and hours and hours in the restaurant, even, you know, starting off doing self shot style stuff, there is a way and you can get there. And then as you move on, you find out about how to do a business plan, how to approach people. Cause you can approach anybody. You can literally approach anybody. And you know, does this person have money? Okay, I'm just gonna ask them, why not? Next for me, I've just had Cannibal Lake or Cannibal Cabin, depending on what it's um, been released as. That's with Empire Studios, so that's Champ Dog and Empire. Um, that's been released in Japanese cinemas, and that's getting a you know rest of the global release soon. So there's more details to follow about that. Um, I've got the documentary with Stephen M. Smith, so that's coming along. And with Scott, a wonderful producer that I work with, we are about to shoot The Curse of the Tooth Fairy 5. So the Tooth Fairy turns up at a school now, starts terrorising people, which is brilliant. And we're doing um, Punch and Judy, which is a horror film based about um, 
the puppets and the puppet origin. And yeah, it's a really, really nice heart to that story. So I'm really looking forward to it. My advice to people starting out is you know what's right with your gut feeling. Don't take advice or take advice from everybody, but don't always take it because not everybody is right. And one, one really good point that's, when I was working in the restaurant, um, I had a friend called Kike and he had like a building company. And um, I remember one day I was stuck on something and I said, Kike, what would you do? He went, I'd ask three people, but one of them would be my worst enemy. And I, and I said, why? And he said, because they would want to prove that they're right and know the right answer. And I was like, that's genius. And I was like, are you sure they wouldn't try and throw you off? And he was like, why would he risk his reputation? And I was like, ah, oh, okay. Yeah, that's genius. And then with the three opinions, you will know from them what's right. Another thing I would say is don't let people tell you no. There's always a way to make a movie. There is always a way. Someone will always help you. You will always find, you know, um, a way to get something. Just do it. Stop holding yourself back. Even if you think it's not gonna, it's not necessarily what you want it to be, you can use that to then get where you wanna be next.